to the tone, please state your name followed by the pound sign. Thank you, Jasper. Can you hear me okay out there? Yep. Great. Well, thanks, Jasper, for giving me an opportunity to present today, and thank you, Nui Pick, for setting this up. I think this is great, getting everyone together and, and kind of doing a knowledge transfer. Um, so my first uh, chance to be in front of you or participate with you, so I'm really excited about that. So we're going to talk today about the Chesapeake Bay Program's efforts to estimate pollution reductions, and really what it's all about is making your progress, making your implementation count. So for those of you not too familiar with the Bay Program, um, it's actually a partnership of federal agencies, state agencies, local governments, um, many, many nonprofits and academic institutions. Uh, as Jasper said, I'm Matt Johnson from the University of Maryland, so um, I'm not part of of federal or state agencies, yet I work for the Bay Program, and that's actually pretty common at the Bay Program are a lot of land-grant university folks and other grantees and contractors um, who have gotten together to all work on this tough issue. There's over 400 individuals, as I like to say, that's a lot of bosses <laughs> on any given day. Um, and then j just a brief uh, background history, there have been four uh, watershed agreements there in the small boxes, 83, 87, 2000, and 2014, and those, those covered all number of goals and outcomes that the uh, jurisdictions across the Chesapeake Bay watershed agreed to. Um, but uh, there was always a water quality component. It really wasn't, though, until the, the 2010 TMDL that things started to ramp up, that tracking and reporting became um, uh, so much more important than it ever was before because the TMDL was the driver there. So why does the Bay Program measure progress? Well, again, going back to that 2010 TMDL, um, the EPA developed what they called an accountability framework. And basically the framework said, uh, jurisdictions, you're gonna develop these plans, these watershed implementation plans that should achieve uh, nutrient and sediment reductions by 2025, which is the end date of the Bay TMDL. And to check in on how you're doing, we're going to ask you to collect um, implementation progress every year and develop two-year milestone plans. Those milestone plans basically are, are by, uh, I'm sorry, every two-year check-ins to make sure that progress is being made and that you can adapt your plans um, as you go out towards 2025. And then the last piece of this accountability framework was commitment to take actions um, if jurisdictions fail to develop plans or demonstrate progress. And that's really important, and that's why I wanted, wanted to start with that today, because there was a hook, and that hook has led us to do many, many things. So how does the Bay Program measure its progress? Well. A lot of this shouldn't be too surprising to you all who work on TMDLs, but first you have to develop the modeling tools, and that's what we're going to review um, first today. Then, then provide reduction targets. Um, what is your TMDL? Then develop implementation plans to meet that TMDL, and then collect implementation data and assess reduction. And then there's two arrows there, and the two arrows go back to our accountability framework where um, if after collecting the data and assessing reductions, uh, jurisdiction's not quite there, then we move back and we develop new implementation plans with that, jur with that jurisdiction. Um, and occasionally, we also uh, go all the way back to develop new modeling tools. So a little bit about our modeling tools. There's a lot of information in our modeling tools and it's driven by our partners. Again, over 400 partners or stakeholders. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time, I, I've been working for the last five years actually on one single model and working with industry, government, and, and all of our stakeholders to review all of the data that goes into the model and approve the methods. And that was key, getting that stakeholder buy-in in, in the model um, the, the stakeholders really feel then that they can communicate 
their needs to um, their legislatures or their local governments or wh whomever they need to because they trust what's in the model. Um, and, and we work to accumulate the best science and these were, this requires a lot of work. Um, one of the things that Jasper and Nuipik asked me to, to point out is how much does this require? Well, gallons and gallons of coffee is an understatement. Um, this, this is five years in the making for our latest model. I think we're on the sixth version um, and there were probably a lot of betas thrown in there too. So uh, a lot of work goes into it, but, but once you have that work done, then really the exciting time begins, which is when you get to develop your plans and push towards implementation. So just a little bit about how complex the modeling tools can be yet how we can translate it into a very simple way for tracking, reporting, and planning purposes. This is our phase six model structure in a very simple format where we estimate the average load coming from uh, a farm field, for example, and that's based on literature information or USGS uh, 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 Sparrow modeling or NOCWA or things like that. And then we have, and then we measure a difference in fertilizer, manure, atmospheric deposition to that land. That difference obviously is going to have some impact on local water quality. We've got an understanding of how many acres of, of the, the farm there are. And then we've got an understanding of the BMPs based upon what the, uh, the states tell us is on that land. And then we get into some other factors that, that transport those nutrients from that edge of the field, edge of the land, down into the local streams, into the rivers, and eventually into the bay. And I just want to hone in on one piece and show you how complex it is and how, uh, what it means to work for five years on this, but then how we can make it simple at the end. So I just dove into inputs here, and this is another schematic looking at how we estimate how inputs have changed across the landscape. For us in agriculture, it's really all about how much manure and how much fertilizer is going down on your pasture versus your crops. But there's a lot inside of that. So if I can dive down one more layer into just the livestock manure, then you start to get into literature values or um, laboratory analyses as to how much each type of animal can produce. Um, and how much, uh, new, how many nutrients are in that manure produced by the animal. And there's just a myriad of uh, decisions that had to be made, presentations that had to be made just like this, saying, are we comfortable with this, uh, with this source? Are you comfortable with this nutrient concentration? Would you like to collect more lab data from your state to update this with a more regional-based number? So that's the process we went through over the last five years. So very, very complex. Um, but then we get to the calibration to water quality monitoring. And that occurs at the bottom of the arrow here. Whenever, whenever we're done estimating how much is coming off the land using the best information available, then we have some factors that kind of decrement that number. Um, maybe that's done because of uh, nutrient retention in the landscape or the streams. But how we figure out how much nutrient retention there is or estimate that is by looking at local water quality data. Um, we've got USGS gauging stations. We're lucky enough to have um, quite a few of them across the watershed that go all the way back to the 80s. So we have that history to be able to tell us, okay, if what we're seeing in the top half of this arrow has been that way for 10 years and the water quality looks this way, we can calibrate what that, um, how much the streams are delivering and how much the rivers are delivering down to the bay. And what that does is it really turns the execution of all that complex stuff I just talked about into a very simple equation. Um, the arrow you see on the screen here can be put into a spreadsheet. It's a little more complicated than that, but it's basically that. For example, you can calculate um, after we got done doing this and calibrating the model, that for every 10 additional pounds of nitrogen placed on the land in, in a specific place, one pound goes to streams, 0.5 goes to rivers, 0.2 goes to the bay. 
And that's the kind of information that we roll out to the partnership at the end of this whole process and say, okay, here you go. After all that complex, all those, those complex decisions, here's it boiled down to just a few parameters that are really important to you. And that happens in something that we call the Chesapeake Assessment Scenario Tool. This is an online portal where users can select their, their geographic area, say it's a county or a HUC 12 um, or a state, and they can look at what the model is estimating for reductions right now. They can also add in their own scenarios where they say, I think I'm going to implement 10,000 uh, acres of state cover crops. What's that going to get me um, in this county or this state or this watershed? They can get those estimates in minutes. And the neat thing um, that the, the partnership pushed for this last time is they wanted to make sure that the same thing the partners were using online, this very simple model, matched exactly what the Chesapeake Bay official watershed model was. And so we made that connection this time around, made it much more simpler so that when a state enters those 10,000 acres of, of cover crops in this online tool and gets an answer, the answer coming out of the Bay program and EPA a year later won't be any different whenever we track in and, and uh, report their progress. There's more that, that goes into the Chesapeake Assessment and Scenario Tool, also known as CAP, than just that. Um, it, it's really our, our data portal, if you will. And we have all kinds of information in there, but I would encourage everybody, if you're wondering if, if this is possible in your neck of the woods, to go to uh, the link on the screen here and download the, the phase six model source data. And that source data really makes this whole process, um, like I said, a lot, more, a lot simpler than it started. There you can find um, what the Bay Program has defined as the BMPs, um, estimated BMP efficiencies, and each one of those efficiencies, I should say, is reviewed by a panel of technical experts and then by our partners. So there's a lot of effort that goes into saying that, that a rye cover crop, for example, is better or worse than a wheat cover crop. And uh, uh, you, you think that might be in the weeds, but some of our partners very, very much care about that as opposed to just having one cover crop efficiency. So there's hundreds of BMPs in there that you can download the efficiencies, and they may or may not be relevant in your, in your area, but they give you a really good starting point um, to, to build from. And then there's also information on our land uses, our animals, um, <clears throat> but then I think uh, another important piece are those delivery factors that you saw in the previous slide with the arrow, those stream to river and river to bay. That's, those are the types of, of factors that you can calculate in your own watershed based on your own uh, nutrient retention and water quality information and really take this, this concept off the shelf and apply it in your own watershed. There's also tutorials and webinars available, so I'd encourage um, everyone to take a look at that. So now we're past developing the model tools, and let's move over to um, providing the reduction targets. So the first step is to basically figure out, as you all know, how much can your water body accept? So the model, the estuary model that we run suggests the bay can receive, you know, X million pounds of nitrogen per year. And that X has to be divvied up between our river basins. And the partnership agrees to rules upon how to do that. And the partnership said the number one rule was the basin that, uh, that contributes the most to the problem on a per acre basis uh, needs to do the most to solve the problem. And so this number is converted into basin targets for everyone. And then those basin targets are actually can be summed up by a state. So that say the state of Pennsylvania knows it has around 77 million pounds of total nitrogen. It cannot, it cannot um, create a plan that says that, that delivery from Pennsylvania will be 85 million pounds of nitrogen in a given year. It's gotta be at that 77 million pounds, whatever practices get you there. And it's really important, the, the last piece on this slide, is that states absolutely determine how to meet the targets. 
once these numbers are given out, um, the Bay Program can provide all kinds of technical assistance to the state, um, all kinds of information about what it costs to do this in stormwater versus ag, uh, and, and how the BMPs relate to one another in costs and nutrient reductions. But when you get down to brass tacks, it's the state of Pennsylvania deciding out of that number that I have to get to, I'm going to say my wastewater treatment plants will do X, my agriculture will do Y, and, and my urban and septic will do Z. So how do we get to that number? Uh, we basically ask the model, out of all these really small watersheds, if uh, say 1,000 pounds of nitrogen left that watershed, what is its impact to dissolve the oxygen in the bay right there? And what that does is then say, here for example for phosphorus, um, where you see the darker purple areas, those might not be contributing the most amount of phosphorus to the, to the bay across their whole watershed, but on a per acre basis or per 1,000 pounds, they contribute the most to the dissolved oxygen problem. So that allows the, the Bay Program to divvy up that, that, uh, that assimilative capacity number it, uh, throughout all the state basins to the ones that contribute most to the problem. But I'll also say there are areas such as um, lower Virginia there that you see, which is all light purple, that really don't impact dissolved oxygen in the Bay very much just because of gravity taking all of that water out towards the ocean. But they have their own standards. So uh, they have a TMDL, for example, in the James River, uh, the river that Richmond, Virginia is on, and a lot of the large cities in Virginia are, are located upon. And they have to go a little bit above and beyond the Chesapeake Bay TMDL in order to hit their chlorophyll TMDL in that river. So uh, we don't just stop at the Bay TMDL. Each one of the jurisdictions takes a look at, um, do I need to go above and, and, and beyond this for my own purposes? So we've got the tools, we've got the reduction targets, and now it's really time to implement the, the plan. So again, states determine exactly how to meet the targets and their plans have to meet those targets. Uh, the, the plans consist of a lot of information, but, but the one that we're really focused on today is the acres or other units of BMPs that are gonna be implemented. And a key rule for us is that all the practices and programs, they've gotta be in place by 2025. Uh, that doesn't mean that the buffers had to be planted 30 years ago and grown out and, 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 and meeting water quality in that year. It's just that the buffers are in place. And the models actually estimate um, whenever we would run a 2025 scenario once we get there, um, we'll estimate that those buffers are grown out so that we can show this is the progress you get because you planted the, the buffer. You, you'll get this progress 30 years from now or so. And a, a, another key point is the Bay Program, once we stop modeling, and, and really this is pertinent because we just stopped uh, a five-year process about a week ago, um, once we stop modeling, we very quickly uh, transition into providing technical assistance to the states to really help them to hone in on the most cost-effective practices, the feasibility of their plans, um, help them produce what they need for their legislatures and local governments to argue for these uh, for, for uh, money and other resources. So here's an example of how the model is used to track progress through time. This is uh, hot off the press from our latest model and this is the estimated nitrogen delivery to the bay from Pennsylvania from 1986 through 2013. Soon we'll have 2016, but I didn't have it today. I apologize. And what you can see here is a, is, is a lot, so let me break down the slide. First off, the bar charts um, add up to the total amount of, of nitrogen delivered in any given year from Pennsylvania to the Bay. Uh, the gray bar is gonna be from your agriculture, blue's developed, green is natural, like wetlands or forest. And then you've got your wastewater uh, point sources, basically and CSO and orange, and then pink, always the smallest one, is septic. And you can see how these have changed through time. Basically, uh, what the model is estimating is that since 1986, um, Pennsylvania has gone from 137 to 114 million pounds. Um, that's a great news story. A lot of that is because of uh, reductions in atmospheric deposition of nitrogen, and we think 
hopefully, implementation of BMPs. However, the, uh, the white line there, which I see because of translation into this type of PowerPoint is a little bit off, but the white line should be a little bit under 80 million. That's 77 million pounds. That's the, the target that we talked about before for Pennsylvania. Um, and then, so, so there are ways off from where they need to be by 2025. So they'll go back and they'll develop a plan to try to get there. And then another thing I wanted to point out here that the Bay Program provides is kind of a, a, a maximum uh, uh, reduction possible or lowest amount of, of nitrogen delivered to the Bay possible. And for the state of Pennsylvania, that's 56 million. Um, now don't think of that as Pennsylvania could actually achieve that. It, it, it's pretty infeasible to achieve that low of reductions, but it sets kind of a maximum extent possible or uh, a technology standard, if you will, from other TMDLs. Um, it lets our partnership say, we're never going to retire more than 20% of agriculture, um, and this is the impact of doing so. So how do we help the, uh, the states develop their plans and then start tracking and reporting towards them? On this screen here, you're gonna see 1986 uh, in the gray bar, our acres of implementation back in 86. The blue bar is acres of implementation for those BMPs in 2013. And then the green bar is what, what we just talked about on the last slide. That is the, the maximum number of acres possible as approved by the, the partnership. And so you can see there that just showing this slide uh, would make Pennsylvania realize there's a long way that we could go. We could certainly get close to this green bar on some of these practices. Um, and we're certainly pretty far away on, on a lot of them right now. I'm gonna zoom in just for a moment on forest buffers um, to show you how we calculate that green bar um, because it's really important to the states what that green bar is so that they can plan towards, okay, I'm not going to eclipse this, this green bar ever. So that green bar represents the total acres of land that could be uh, buffered, uh, total acres of cropland that could be buffered in Pennsylvania. We do this for a lot of BMPs and, and for forest buffers, we're able to do this with some high resolution land use data. Um, that high resolution land use data uh, allows us to take a look at crops like you see here and at streams that run through those crops and draw a buffer around it, you know, say, say 100 feet and calculate, okay, how much of that buffer is actually in cropland versus um, not in cropland. And the result of that is something like this, a probability mask that there are not trees growing here and that it is cropland. So out of that probability mask, we're able to say across the whole state of Pennsylvania, after we added this all up, you've got about 110,000 acres of row crops you could put towards forest buffers. So that tells Pennsylvania, well, I'm not gonna write a plan for 120,000. And I'm probably not gonna write a plan for 110. I'm probably gonna write around 80, 90, maybe 100,000. And uh, even that will be quite a lift. And the, the, uh, the other power of this tool is that this kind of information can be downloaded from Bay Program websites so that really anybody can do this analysis. I zoomed in here on, gosh, just a four parcel um, um, area here. And so you could actually go in and talk to that farmer and, and, or visit that field uh, once you get down to, to small watershed plants. So now that we've got our tools, we've provided the targets, we've developed our plans, how do we collect the data and assess progress made towards that reduction target? Well, we use something called the National Environmental Information Exchange Network. Some of you may be familiar with that, NEAN for short. BMPs are tracked and reported individually by the state and by the USDA and RCS. USDA and RCS hands over their BMP data um, at, a, at an aggregated level to the state. The states collect it, they combine it with all of their BMP information for say new um, storm, new development stormwater standards um, or for the urban forest buffers they just planted with some grant or, or what have you. And they put that into their own database so that they can query at any time they want to but what they were asked to do a few years back 
was to develop a way to translate it into one single format, uh, the NEAN format, which is an XML. And that XML allows us to say, state, please record all this information in your database and put it into this XML so that it's standardized across everyone. Um, it creates a standard data reporting matrix, but it also, I should say, one of the things that, that, that Nui Pick asked me to say again was, um, what's the cost, you know, is this difficult? It is a little difficult. It requires significant maintenance at least every two years, if not every year. And some of our states have struggled with that maintenance component as IT departments are overtasked in their states um, and are asked to do 25 things in the span of an hour. <laughs> they just get, get, get placed uh, lower down on the totem pole. And here we are saying, well, it's gotta be done, it's gotta be done. So that's something that you should consider if you consider going the route of NEAN is to always remember that maintenance is important. And you can set up maintenance agreements um, outside of the state itself if the state allows you to with a third party. Some of our states have done that, and for some of them, that's been very successful because it's much easier for them to go to that third party contractor than it is to their state IT department sometimes. So once that information is collected from the XML, we plug it into the model in that arrow, figure out what the reductions are, and it all comes out into a report that you see on the screen here. This is a report from a couple of years ago from the EPA Chesapeake Bay Program Office. And on the left, you can kind of see some, some charts there of overall nitrogen loads and goals, um, phosphorus and sediment. And then on the right, you can also see um, some information on the, the oversight component. Again, going back to the Chesapeake Bay TMDL, the reason why we track and count and report progress in the way that we do and why it's so important for the states to do so is it plays a lot into um, whether or not EPA um, has, a, has to take actions, whether or not they see progress occurring. And so you can see there that based on the latest information, there were some actions um, that EPA was considering for some states, but, but not for others. And this information is all available online as well. So you can see how the model data rolls into an annual or uh, every two year assessment. But I should say that we've talked an awful lot today about the um, progress being assessed in BMPs and all of our, our, all of our models to assess that progress. But it's a lot more than just that. Those implementation plans the states have have a lot of programmatic goals. And, and we really take a look at the programmatic goals to see if policies and programs are in place, if they're moving towards, maybe, maybe they didn't get the 10,000 acres of buffers that they thought they would, or are they moving towards the capacity to put 10,000 acres on the ground by 2025? That's really an important part of the assessment. Another important part, uh, and I can't stress this enough, is once you've got the water quality data set out there, if, you, if you've got a long-term data set, then you can really start assessing progress with more than a model. And we were just entering that time period in the Bay Program where we feel like we can start assessing progress with more than the model and start turning to our USGS colleagues and asking them, is progress being made in the Susquehanna River, for example, through Pennsylvania? So this is a little uh, uh, snapshot for you of an interactive online tool that USGS has put out for the monitoring stations in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And on the left-hand side, a purple arrow means that the loads are going down, that's great, and a red arrow means the loads are going up. You can actually toggle back and forth between short-term and long-term trends. You can go back and forth between the constituent you're worried about, uh, total nitrogen, or dissolved inorganic phosphorus, for example. And then what you can also do is zoom into an individual monitoring station. And an individual monitoring station, I would argue, doesn't give the Bay Program a lot of information on its own. It's when you look at many of them around, say, the Susquehanna River that you start to get a sense of what's happening in Pennsylvania. So I zoomed in on the right-hand side of the slide to the, uh, uh, one of the tributaries of the Susquehanna and this is the kind of information that can be pulled out for each of the monitoring stations around the watershed. 
uh, you see there a 30% reduction in total nitrogen uh, over the last, I, I believe it's 35 years, is what the, the long term means. Um, and a 53% reduction in dissolved inorganic phosphorus. So a lot of really good things are, are happening in the state of Pennsylvania in terms of nutrient reductions. And that is played out by the model. Um, as you saw in the first chart, we had reductions occurring in Pennsylvania. And it's confirmed by the water quality monitoring data. And so hopefully that rolls into the assessment the next time around and we're able to say congratulations a lot of, of, of good things are happening but you've still got a long way to go and, and we're going to help you to get there. So then as, as I uh, said at the very beginning of the presentation and I'll roll back that way now that we're at the end, whenever we get to the end of, of an assessment there's always the option to go back to develop implementation plans all over. And in fact, um, one of the things that the partnership agreed to was to do just that. Uh, after the 2010 TNDL was written, it was agreed that in 2017, we'd assess everything again and we would write new implementation plans. So states are beginning that process as we speak. Um, and then every five to 10 years, and again, we just got done, I guess this week, not last week, this week, uh, with another version, we can go back and develop new modeling tools. And that process, again, it, it takes about five years. So it, it's a lot of work in between time. So the last thing that I wanted to leave you with today, and then I'm sure we'll have questions here at the end, are some lessons learned from the process that we go through. Um, and these are from my perspective. Please don't think they're from, they represent anyone else from the partnership. The number one thing that I've learned from the last five years uh, designing this model <clears throat> is that we talk a lot about BMPs and that's good, but inputs really, really matter. You look across a lot of the other water quality models around the nation and there is not an accounting of BMPs. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure that if they tried to account for BMPs that it would show up as an important regressor, say in a Sparrow model, I really don't know. But what does show up as important regressors, important parameters in the Sparrow modeling from USGS is inputs. Inputs really matter. So we spent a lot of time over the last five years trying to get our inputs right and trying to make sure stakeholders were comfortable with what the inputs looked like. Because we wanna measure more than just the buffers that are going down on the ground. We wanna say we need to drive towards lower inputs in the future. Whatever that means, maybe that means more crop yields and, 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 and lower nutrient inputs per acre of cropland, or whether that means some legislation that uh, limits the amount of fertilizer sold in a, in a Home Depot bag of fertilizer for lawns. Whatever that means, we need to drive towards lower inputs. The second thing is really to engage the stakeholders. I was extremely surprised when starting this process five years ago that the stakeholders would want to dive into the weeds of the nutrient concentration uh, coming out of the back end of a cow, but they really did. And once they dove into, the, into that and they were convinced by the science and, and, and liked what they were seeing and could say, yeah, I've got some lab data that confirms that, then all of a sudden they had buy-in into our, our, our progress and reporting tool. And I think that's really important. The third thing is really just to set clear targets, but really hold them constant. So we can't go back to Pennsylvania every year and say, instead of 77 million, it's 78 or 79 or, or, or 80. Um, we've got to hold that constant for some period of time. The next one is, is to adjust the modeling tools occasionally, but I would argue after going through this last very large adjustment, that we've got to keep them constant for a significant amount of time. For the same reason as, as the previous one, you, you don't wanna move the target for anybody. And you also don't wanna move how much say their cover crops are worth. Um, if you're tracking towards progress, you wanna keep the, the rules the same. And again, we talked about this one, but tracking via a database such as NEAN, it requires a lot of costly maintenance. Um, so that's gotta be considered if you're going to, to go that route as opposed to maybe, um, maybe say a spreadsheet route, which is not as standardized, but certainly um, 
uh, doesn't cost as much as the database maintenance. And then the last thing I'll say is don't just model, track, progress, repeat, model, track, progress, repeat. Uh, we are getting, I, I, I feel that we as a, as a nation are getting good at modeling and, and doing TMDL. Um, but we need to really put an emphasis on providing significant technical assistance to our partners. Um, my main job from here forward in the partnership is to work with Pennsylvania, for example, to say, we can help you with all the, the technical information you need to make sure you hit that 77 million pounds. We're not going to say 77 million pounds and walk away. That is, I don't believe, would be successful. So I think we've all got the same goal in a partnership like this and, and in all of your partnerships, those of you who are on the phone, but not everybody has the same data. So now that we've taken five years to develop all this information, let's use it to the best of our ability. And I just wanted to end with a question slide, but more importantly is the picture on the slide. Uh, forget about the modeling, forget about the water quality mo uh, uh, monitoring, forget about the BMPs. There were dolphins all the way up in Annapolis and north of Annapolis this year, um, an indicator species coming back for the first time in many, many, many years, uh, dozens of them. And so that's Annapolis in the background and it just shows you that if, if you set your goal, if you keep driving towards that goal uh, in, in a process like this, that we can do really great things. And so I hope that that's proof uh, of, of concept right there. Thank you again for having me today. Thanks, Matt. Um, we have time for a few questions now and then We'll always have time for more at the end of Jason's presentation. But uh, so a couple of the ones that came in. Um, is it assumed that BMPs can be applied anywhere or even everywhere? And um, are space constraints and other local factors considered? Constraints are certainly considered in the tool, in the cast tool, where let's say that you're dealing with, uh, say, cover crops you're constrained to just row crop land. It's not assumed that you can apply cover crops to hay or pasture. Um, similar with the forest buffers, you're gonna be constrained to some number of acres. You can't just buffer the entire uh, watershed and plant every acre with trees. And then the, the other thing I would say to that is, again, the states are using that information on what the constraints are to develop their plans so that they don't have unreasonable expectations for what's achievable. Uh, sorry, I have myself on mute. Um, is the assumption that BMPs will perform to the same level everywhere? and is target attainment based on that assumption? Yeah, great question. No, the assumption is not that BNPs will perform to the same um, level everywhere. In fact, if you dig into the CAST data, source data tab, you'll find that depending on your, uh, your region, whether or not you have um, carbonate rock underlying you or, or sandy soil, we actually uh, vary the BMP efficiency a little bit. I'll also say that the, the technical expert panels that develop those efficiencies, um, the partnership has asked them to be conservative if possible, to take a look across all the literature and all the findings and not take the most uh, uh, beneficial number, but say, you know, here's the, the 75% uh, percentile or something like that. So we do try to reduce it from the best case scenario. Okay, great. Um, is ag and other non-point source implementation regulated in some or all states or is it incentives based? That's a very good question. Um, it varies by state, but a lot of the, what we call cost share dollars that are out there um, are developed by the states and are voluntary 
um, by the, by the uh, agricultural partners. Now, I will say that some states have begun to be innovative with that. And so, for example, in Virginia, they are trying to um, get stream exclusion, get cows uh, fenced out of streams and place buffers on the ground. And the way that they've been able to uh, increase implementation there is to say, if you do that and four other practices, prescribed grazing, nutrient management, uh, what have you, then you will be protected from any further legislation in the next 10 or 20 years. I can't remember what it is. So it's this concept of if you do enough to meet the TMDL on, if you would, on your farm, you'll be protected from future regulation for a certain amount of time which is, has upped the game from voluntary to um, really incentive-based. Okay, and uh, we got time for one more now, and then we'll get to the rest afterwards. Um, does the tracking consider conversion of forest land to new agriculture or urban uses, as well as the effects of climate change? Yeah, great question. The, we do have a land use model that I did not go into where we try to, to trace back to the 80s um, how land use has changed over time. Using that information, we also project out into the future. So we do see agricultural land um, um, eating away at forests during some of that period, but actually what we're seeing now, at least in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, is uh, a loss of agricultural land and forest land to developed land. So when the states put together their plans, they will need to account for that. They'll need to account for, uh, say, eight years from now, there may be 10% more developed land, but there may also be 5% less forests and 5% less agriculture. So that's a very important factor in the modeling and tracking. And then the second point about climate change, um, climate, the partnership just completed uh, an assessment of climate change and found that, interestingly enough, the latest science tells us that um, the, we'll have increased precipitation, but also increased evapotranspiration that might wipe out some of the increased flows and nutrients that we would expect. But then the really interesting part is that as sea level rises in the Chesapeake Bay, we can expect more flushing from the, uh, from the ocean. So in the end, uh, climate change, uh, it, it, it may be a wash based on the latest science. For water quality, I shouldn't say a wash for all all ecosystem goals. Okay, great. Um, so thanks again, uh, Matt. Uh, we'll come back to you uh, for a couple more questions uh, at the end of the webinar. Great, thank you, Jasper. Thank you, everyone. Um, so now we're going to move on to uh, Jason Sutter. Jason, I'm about to give you control now, and take it away. All right, thank you, Jasper. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how Arizona um, is tracking improvements. Those of us who've been around the Clean Water Act programs, 303D, TMDL, water quality assessments, and non-point source, um, we're familiar with um, some of the performance measures that EPA has been trying to use, whether it's the SB 10 and 12 or the newer water quality 27 and 28 um, or the annual reporting for non-point source, um, everybody's interested in trying to show progress towards attaining water quality standards um, in our impaired waters. In 2014, DEQ updated our strategic plan, and, and part of that was our leadership came up with um, 25 outcome-based performance measures um, that applied to all the programs in the agency. And basically the, the one that was related to TMDLs was we needed to show improved water quality in 50% of monitored waters of the state over five years. Um, and the sort of rollout of the new strategic plan coincided with the agency really getting into uh, continuous improvement or what we call lean um, where we're, we're always looking at ways to continue uh, to improve not only how quickly we can get permits out the door and keep them environmentally protective, but also on the flip side, trying to restore 
um, waters that have issues. And, and part of that is a lot of visual indicators or management that we can we can walk through the halls and see where things are changing. Um, and so when we got this performance measure rolled down from our leadership, we were sort of taken aback because we we'd never really had to sort of have an internal performance measure that one, we had to develop the methodology for, but also two, report on on a monthly basis. Um, typically water quality doesn't change quite that often and it really took us a long time to wrap our head around how are we going to track improvement. Um, and that all really started with trying to figure out what our universe was. What is a monitored water? Is that all the waters that PDEQ has sampled? Is it all the waters that we potentially could have data for? Does that include USGS data? Um, and then what is improved? Uh, is that simply a change in concentration uh, moving towards meeting the standard? How big of a change? Um, so those were the questions that we really struggled with um, for quite some time. Um, and so as we were doing that, you know, we looked at what would make the most sense, what can we look at on a, a regular basis and really communicate um, to others that yes, this is a change. Um, as we all know, when we talk about micrograms per liter or milligrams per liter and we talk about the assessment and its methodology and how many samples do we need and how many need to exceed, it really starts to get into the weeds quickly and we often lose even colleagues who aren't you know, familiar with the day in and day out operation of those programs, much less our leadership and certainly um, the public. And so we were trying to figure out a way that we could easily, easily communicate changes um, but also trying to standardize the scale um, because again, a percent change, 25% improvement in copper in one stream doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as a 25% improvement of copper in another stream. There's really no baseline or normalization for those numbers. Um, and we also want to be able to reproduce results because if we, we establish a baseline, we want to be able to use the same methodology um, to track those improvements. And we also want to have anyone else who uses that data set to be able to come up with the same number. And again, since we had to report on this on a monthly basis originally, we needed something that we could continually pump uh, new data into um, and come up with a new number. And just to be upfront, DEQ, we didn't invent the wheel. Um, we refined maybe a few of the spokes or changed a few. Um, the first index that we were able to find was dated from 1970 from the National Sanitary Foundation. Um, we also looked at Oregon and California. Um, and as we dove into the methodologies and sort of um, the information that went into the indices and what the output was, we sort of we, we came up with the example from British Columbia, which was adopted by Canada as a whole, and sort of took that as our baseline and ran with it. Um, their index dates from the early 90s. Um, it dealt with designated uses and the water quality objectives served as the benchmark. Um, and so for us, that, that made sense. Um, and again, we wanted something that wasn't necessarily a black box. We wanted something that has been accepted. Um, it's transparent, and we can certainly um, look at some other examples from around the world, whether it's the United Nations, the World Health Organization, um, and they all hey, seem to be uh, centered. Jason? On... Yes? Um, I don't think your slides are advancing. They are on my screen. Uh, should the top one is going global? Uh, no, it's still on your first slide. Um, hmm. Oh, let me try something really quick because um, you did join twice. Okay, that worked. Okay, we're caught up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. And so as we dove in a little bit more, no, oh, now it's not advancing for me. Uh, 
I think I've lost control, Jasper. Are you there, Jasper? Yeah, um, I think your audio and your computer might be two separate um, versions of yourself somehow. So I can advance them for you if you want. Okay, so go back to full screen. Yep. Okay, sorry about that, folks. A little technical problem. You can ad advance, Jasper. And so there, there are several different types of water quality indices that are out there. Um, we've used the fuzzy, fuzzy logic um, in some of our watershed-based plans that we we developed um, in the early 2000s. It's a little bit more subjective. Um, we settled upon the baseline comparative model, which again is an example from British Columbia and Canada. Um, it's again, we wanted something straightforward, transparent, um, in that other people could pick up or look at and not question what we did or how we did it. Oh, I seem to have control back. Um, and so, how did we arrive at Arizona's uh, water quality index? Um, we wanted something that we could use on a, a regular basis. We were using our water quality standards as the benchmark. Um, again, trying to remove um, any weighting um, that could be subjective, one person weights one um, parameter higher than another. Um, the index considers both both the frequency and magnitude of exceedances. So as we change the number or magnitude, the, the number is going to change. Um, it's modular. We can apply it to one variable or we can set it to a, a number of variables, which I'll talk about in the, the next slide. Um, and it's flexible. We can apply it um, to one variable or many variables, a smaller data set, a larger data set. It, it really doesn't matter. Um, and so the math. Um, I'm not the statistician. I'm not the one who dove into the math. I was more on the programmatic side. So if there's any really in-depth questions about how we did this, I'm happy to refer you to my uh, colleague, Doug. Um, but again, it, it's a relatively simple, straightforward method where we're talking about the number of exceedances across all the variables. Again, the frequency, how often do they occur, and how large are those exceedances. And so, again, our, our standards are the benchmark for our comparisons and our calculations. Um, there are a few standards that we have um, where, for instance, with the E. coli, we have both a geo mean and a single sample maximum. With our nutrient and phosphorus standards, we have single sample maximums, annual means, and 90th percentile values. And so part of the decision process for us was how do we capture the most meaningful data to show that we can move the bar? Um, our WQI protocols don't match exactly with our methodology. Um, and I was asked to point out that that's not a bug, um, it's a feature. We're not doing full-blown assessments um, when we're trying to calculate these numbers. What we're trying to show is that the bar has moved either up or down, um, and then using that as sort of a, a management tool to figure out what additional work needs to be done or did something that we implemented not work and why so we don't repeat that mistake. Um, and part of the basis for our calculation is we look at the most um, conservative or stringent designated use and associated standard. And so it's, it's really trying to get at protecting all those designated uses. Um, and currently, for the most part, we calculate uh, the WQI at the reach level, which coincides with um, the way we assess waters across the state. What we've done is we sort of divided or have two approaches to how we calculate our index. 
Um, one is sort of a general water quality index, and it's based on our, our set of core parameters, um, which is laid out in our assessment methodology. And along the uh, right-hand side of the screen there, it lists the different core parameters for the different designated uses. Um, these are also represent the minimum set of data we need to make a, a fully attaining assessment in our 305B report. Um, and the reason that we went with this sort of core parameter data set is um, these are parameters we frequently saw as exceedances in past assignments, assessments. They're included in our ambient monitoring suite. Uh, we don't have issues with reporting limits, causing non-detects. Um, and the criteria that we use um, support the application of them. Um, a little bit of a caveat, which I'll get into in the next one here. I think I've lost control again, Jasper. Did you forward for me? Thank you. Um, and so with our general water quality index, you'll notice the formula here on this slide is missing the, the F1 variable. And so what we've sort of taken out is the, the whole population of water quality data. Now we're focusing on uh, the impairing parameter. And so now we're down to the frequency of exceedances and the magnitude of exceedances. And so this is where we dive into um, our realm of improved waters. Um, what we finally came up with for our, our, our performance metric is, or measure is that monitoring alone doesn't improve water quality. Um, and so we, we moved away from reporting on all of our monitoring activities to focusing on monitoring activities in areas that we were hoping to see an improvement in the next five years. Um, so those were areas where we either had active or previously Im implemented 319 projects, um, where another entity was implementing a project to improve water quality, whether it was a forest service under a circle action or uh, a municipality upgrading a, a water, wastewater treatment plant. Um, so we, we narrowed our universe to where we thought we could make improvements. Um, and so as we did that, oh, back up one more, sorry. As we did that, we really honed in on pollutant specific, a pollutant specific index rather than a, a general water quality index. And on the, the left hand end of the screen is just an example of our latest iteration of a water quality score report. Um, and so early on, we sort of had this uh, speedometer um, graphic, which our index goes from zero to 100. Um, again, it's, it's something that most people can understand and grasp pretty quickly. If it's down near zero in the red, that's bad. If it's up near 100 in the green, that's a, an indication of good water quality. Um, and so originally we'd come up with a number and then put it on the speedometer. But over the years, we sort of realized that isn't really capturing all the data that we want to be able to, to produce to the folks. If someone wants to look at um, a water quality report, we should be able to show them the reach, the analyte, the date range, um, the number of exceedances, the number of results. And so we came up with this report, um, and then the tail end of it lists all of the data and would highlight exceedances in red. Um, but as we started working through this, and if you could advance for me. Um, we sort of had to communicate what was good, what was bad, and um, we used uh, the Canadian example as sort of the springboard once again. And just to, to review over the, the speedometer, um, below a 60, we're seeing frequent and persistent exceedances. Um, as you move up towards 100 and reach 100, we're not seeing any of those water quality exceedances. And just um, so everyone knows, you know, we didn't get this right the first time. We had questions internally, but also, you know, from those who are reviewing our data and what these numbers mean. Um, so we've sort of adjusted this over time. Uh, next slide, please. And just to give you an example of, um, a few examples of our general versus pollutant specific water quality index. Um, these are both examples from the Gila River, which flows through um, 
Arizona, starts in New Mexico, flows through the Phoenix area and down out uh, towards Yuma and the Colorado River. Um, these are both examples of selenium and boron impaired waters. Um, the one on the left is near the Yuma area. And we can see that pre-implementation or, you know, TMDL development um, water quality score index scores for boron and selenium were rather low. So we we're seeing a number of exceedances at high magnitude. Um, and then the, the general uh, water quality index for that reach um, is represented by the 71. And so just quickly visually looking at that, we can say overall water quality is pretty good and the selenium and boron are sort of dragging that number down. Um, on the right-hand side is another um, reach of the Gila, or I'm sorry, the Gila, um, but actually the, the right-hand side is near Yuma, the left-hand side is near Phoenix, sorry about that. Um, but here we had an issue where as we started the TMDL investigation, when we started collecting more data and digging into um, the data used for listing, we actually realized that there's a sort of a hydrologic disconnect between um, the segments within the reach we assessed as impaired. Um, and so as we broke that data apart, um, that upper reach actually showed that um, there was no selenium impairment and that we didn't see very many um, boron exceedances. Um, and so you can see on this, on the right-hand side, selenium at 100, borons above 91, you know, did we have a problem with our assessment? Why would we have something that was impaired rating so high? And like I said, come to find out that yes, there's um, almost like a hydrologic barrier between two segments. And so we ended up splitting those segments um, and delisting the segment that this um, data represents. And next slide, please. And so what have we been able to show with this? Um, we've gone through and we calculated um, a pre-implementation or initial water quality index score for all of our impaired waters. Um, for Arizona, that universe is relatively small. Um, we're at 144 impaired waters at this point, or approximately 190 um, pollutants. So for us to go through this exercise, it's not as difficult as uh, a state that might have a thousand um, impairments. Now, I'll get to sort of the technology side here, side of it in a few slides. Um, so what were, we, what were we able to show uh, for our performance measure? Um, through fiscal year 16, uh, we're showing that 43% of our waters, our monitored waters of the state, had showed an improvement compared to the baseline, or 25 out of 58 waters. And again, that was on a that's on a pollutant by pollutant basis. Um, so that wasn't necessarily 58 waters, but 58 pollutants that we had uh, sampled for. Um, in FY17, our metric or performance measure changed a little bit um, because our, our sort of master target list of waters that we were sampling for to show that improvement were sort of always changing. If we delisted a water, it came off, off the list. If we implemented a new project, we wanted to add it to the list. And so our, our percentage change became a little bit, um, you really couldn't compare it from year to year as we were um, adding and taking waters off. And so the new performance measure was just a straight number of uh, target waters improved. And so we rolled that into our FY17 planning. Um, the goal was 12. We actually were able to show an improvement on 27 waters. Um, and that rolled up into our, our current fiscal year goal of showing improvement on um, 40 impaired waters. And so the graph on the, the right-hand side or the spreadsheet is a little bit tough to show or to see, but really what I was trying to convey is that as we were calculating these initial water quality um, indice numbers, it really started to show us that there was some disconnect between our assessment methodology in what our water quality scores were showing. Um, part of that is a difference between how many, you know, if we're using or listing based on the geo mean or an annual mean, and then we're using uh, the, the water quality index on a single sample maximum um, basis. But it really did start to open our eyes 
two, is there something in our assessment that we're listing waters that really aren't um, that bad? Um, and what can we do to fix that? Um, and next slide. And so this is just a, a quick and simple graphic on how we started to use this water. And I mentioned that typically we use the water quality index or calculate it based on a reach basis. This is actually um, on a, a single site um, that we were sampling right below a tailings pile that had been remediated. Um, just a little bit of backstory. This site had three separate piles. Uh, one had a discharging at it. We'd been working for well over a decade to get something implemented back in late 2014, early 2015. One pile on BLM land was remediated, um, and the other two, which were located downstream, had not been worked on yet. Uh, we just finished implementing a project on the lower pile um, in May, and now we're still working on the middle pile, which also has the added discharge. And so the reason I say that is this particular graph is really showing and trying to track the improvement based on that first um, project that was implemented. And so that's why it's based on a, on a point rather than a reach. Um, once we get the added addressed in the middle pile um, capped or remediated, then we'll sort of pool this data and look at it on a, on a reach level. And so that's sort of the, the built-in flexibility um, that we have when we're calculating our, our water quality index is that um, we can drill into a site or we can sort of pull back on a reach level and compare that. Uh, but the take-home message here is um, on the left-hand side, we've got the initial scores from basically the data used when we developed the TMDL and then subsequent uh, fiscal year data uh, moving off to the, the right-hand side. And I will say, the data used in this is sparse. It's really only one data point uh, per year. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so right off the bat, we saw an improvement in zinc and copper. And then we sort of saw a little decline in zinc and then it ramped up. And so, you know, what we have here is it was a, about a thousand cubic yard tailings pile. There's water infiltrating through it right adjacent to the stream. And so what we're seeing is a little bit of noise because of a, a few data points, but also we sort of had a, a saturated system um, that was still uh, leaching into the stream. And now that we've implemented another project in the watershed or immediately downstream, this fiscal year we're going out on a quarterly basis. And so our, our annual increase and hopefully our noise um, will start to decrease. Next slide. And so originally, uh, when we started this project, we were using a, a Visual Basic-based uh, Excel worksheet, basically macros. Um, we'd import the data into Excel, run the macro. Um, we'd have to do a little bit of hand manipulation as far as entering the applicable standard, and then you know, run the macro again to, to get the, the WQI number out. Um, as we progressed, we moved into an access database um, and incorporated individual analyte indices in addition to the, the general, and it started to become a little bit more automated where we had drop-down menus. You could pick the huck and reach you wanted, pick the analyte, pick the designated use, and those numbers were, were crunched in the background as the access uh, was pinging our Oracle database and it would produce the report um, basically on the, the left-hand side of the screen. Um, and again, this is another example of total nitrogen where we really assess on the annual mean um, criteria, but we're using the single sample maximum um, as the, the basis for the WQI calculations. And so even though the, the number was relatively high here to 98, um, and that was using data um, post-implementation of some projects that we did. It was very comparable to the number pre-implementation, which was 91. And so, you know, originally we were looking at, on the improved side of the metric or measure, uh, a greater than 10-point um, increase in the WQI 
that as we started crunching numbers, we realized that that wasn't going to work because of some of the difference between our assessment methodology and WQI calculations. Um, and so currently we're using an improvement greater than or equal to one in the WQI score as an improvement. Um, but we also found that some of our, our metals impairments were so large in magnitude that WQI started out at a zero, even if we implemented projects and had order of magnitude reduction in the amount of pollutant coming in, it only raised it to a one. Um, and so we've sort of incorporated a little bit of fudge factor to say, you know, magnitude, order of magnitude improvement also counts an improvement. We also count D-list as an improvement um, because ultimately that is the goal of trying to track these, whether it's Arizona's WQI or EPA's um, performance measures, the end game is to, to delist waters and having them attaining um, their standards. Um, we currently migrated to a sort of a third party uh, water quality database, which is great from the data entry and getting data out point of view, but it sort of broke uh, the, the original tools that we had for calculating the water quality index. Um, and so we sort of put some duct tape and bubble gum on the old ones and at least have it so we, we can um, run the WQI for what is now our quarterly um, reporting that we have to do. Um, but we're also working with the vendor to basically get those WQI calculations hardwired into a module in the new database. Um, that way, it's a little bit more automated. We can hopefully run them in batches um, because right now we're doing it water by water, reach by reach, parameter by parameter. Um, and so we're trying to move it towards a more automated system so that we can go beyond just um, impaired waters, but look at things on a larger scale. Next slide, please. And so some lessons learned. Um, Similar to Matt, um, you're not going to get this right the first time. Um, part of you know our continuous improvement is always the, what we call the Deming Circle, the Plan Do Check Act. Is it working the way we want it to? If not, why? Let's fix it. Um, I think also what we've learned is that the assessment methodologies that we currently have uh, may be a little bit overly conservative. Um, going back to our, our E. coli, e. coli um, example, it only takes two exceedances of the E. coli standard to become impaired um, over our assessment period. And what we found is we can spend a lot of time trying to chase down E. coli exceedances that are really storm-related and are they impacting human health. Um, so I, through this process and you know even looking more towards the triennial review and the new, or the 2012 um, recreational water criteria is reevaluating our assessment methodologies and trying to figure out are they really being protective or are being overprotective. Um, minimal data sets that can be used, as my Boulder Creek example, you can run RWQI with one sample. If you don't get an exceedance, it's going to be 100. If you get one exceedance, it's going to vary based on the magnitude of that exceedance. So if you're close to the standard, it might be in the 70s, 80s. If you're way above it, you're going to be down near 0 to 20. Um, it produces a number. We can use that number. But the longer time steps are, are, are a better approach. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do is we run that on a, a quarterly basis now, but we also then go back and run it on an annual basis where we have the data. Um, it's flexible. The scale can be adjusted for specific projects. Again, we can do it at the at a, a single site if it warrants, or we do it at the reach level. Um, I will say, from a technical support standpoint, my colleague is very good at both Excel and Access. But I'll be honest, almost every time I open those um, applications, something broke. Um, it's just inherent running those macros and things get changed in, inadvertently. Um, it took a lot of TLC, 
a lot of time. Um, it, I would say it took more time to try and keep those running than it did to actually get the numbers out. Um, so, you know, I, I would recommend that folks really get some IT support behind them um, if they want to go down this road. And next slide. And so sort of the future steps I alluded to a little bit is, you know, also similar to what Matt showed on his uh, progress report. It looked like there are some red, yellow, and green boxes um, in there is that we want to be able to take our water quality index and, like I said, apply it towards our annual ambient monitoring or, you know, pull in that ambient monitoring, run those numbers on a statewide basis for all those stream reaches and lakes that we have data for, and then using sort of our, our, our classifications, produce a statewide map that has red dots, yellow dots, green dots, or stream reaches, however we are able to produce that and convey that message out to folks to use that as a larger management plan that if all of a sudden we have a, a lot of exceedance in, a, is a, in an area that isn't impaired, we didn't know there was a problem, what does that mean? Do we have um, zip these permits in the area that all of a sudden are, are no longer complying with their permits? Or do we have some type of other illicit discharge um, that we can take this tool and apply it more broadly? Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Jason. Um, we do have a couple of questions um, that have come in. Um, so one was, uh, where does the value 1.414 come from in the um, WKI formula? And again, 1.1, uh, and that would have been okay on the, the site specific or the analyte specific. Yeah. Um, I will have to take that question back to my colleague. Um, again, I unfortunately am not the, the one who dove into the math. Um, but if Jasper, if you could forward me who sent that, I'm, I'm happy to circle back with them. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. Um, can you explain further what drove the need to develop the WQ, WQI and why um, the assessments are so frequent? Yeah, the, the the driving factor was really an easy way to show improvement. Um, I think we struggled with if we go if we use a percent improvement or a percent change in concentration, is that really scalable to from one stream reach to another? Um, using the WQI sort of normalizes both overall water quality, but then um, pollutant-specific water quality um, to a scale from zero to 100. So in the example I showed um, for the Gila Rivers, boron selenium near Yuma um, or near Phoenix were, you know, in the zero to 20 range, where down in Yuma they were above 90. And so from a, a sort of management viewpoint, do we want to tackle the high magnitude, high frequency exceedances first um, and leave what seems appears to be higher water quality sort of as the, the, the second um, tier project? Um, and then the second part of the question, sorry. Um, and uh, why are they, why um, the assessments need to be so frequent or will be, I guess? Yeah. Um, <laughs> As far as reporting, that really threw us when it first came out, as far as the monthly reporting. Um, when that came out, that was across all programs, all performance measures, um, and is still sort of the, the, the basic reporting um, frequency for most of the agency. Um, it, it sort of came out of the, the continuous improvement mentality that if you're looking at things on a monthly basis throughout the year, that basically gives you 12 opportunities to evaluate and fix um, what might be holding you back. 
Um, and so if you have a very linear program where you get a, a permit application in and it's processed and then it continues down the line, that's very uh, easy to track on a routine, very reoccurring basis. But for us, with water quality, it just doesn't change that often. And so it, it took several years for us to sort of show that um, and to get that message across to our leadership um, that it, it wasn't as conducive to improving water quality as it is to maybe a, a, a process that is linear and goes from A to B to C to D. Um, we're currently reporting on this in our other metric um, on a, a quarterly basis. And so, although we've got a little bit of reprieve, it's still um, a pretty quick turnaround um, and doesn't truly capture um, the changes in water quality. And so, again, that's why from more of a programmatic standpoint, we also want to look at those on an annual basis where we have more data to put into the calculations and actually have um, a little bit better idea of um, what the true improvement hopefully is or the true change um, so that way we can then uh, move forward on any other actions that need to be taken. Okay, uh, great. We do have a couple more questions um, before we get to them. I would like to just remind people that um, at 3 o'clock today um, Eastern Time is the September Aqua Watersheds Committee call which will feature a presentation by Joe Schmies, um, who's the Section Chief for Indiana DEM Watershed Planning and Restoration. And this will focus on Indiana's experience working with ag and the NRCS and other stakeholders on a number of issues. Um, conference line and participant code are here if you haven't gotten that um, from ACWA themselves. Um, I'm also now going to unmute Matt and um, we do have a couple more questions we'll get to. And if you have any questions for either um, presenter today, you can still send them in through the Q&A. And we'll wrap up in probably about 10 minutes. Um, so still for Jason, um, is got a couple more questions here. Um, how do you assess and include uncertainty in your index for attainment purposes? Yeah, the index really isn't used for the attainments per se. I, you know, we still have a disconnect between our assessment methodologies and the numbers that come out of the WQI. Um, what we would use, you know, if, if, if we see we have an impaired water um, where its initial WQI is really high, it's going to trigger us to go back and to look at the original assessment um, and also if we see a high WQI for nutrients sort of across the board, then diving in beyond just the original assessment data, but then looking at the assessment methodology. Um, again, it, we want to delist waters, of course, but we don't want to delist them for the wrong reasons or list them for the wrong reasons. So we're not using this as a tool to say, oh, we just need to change our methodology because it just is producing too many um, impairments, we just want to make sure that that methodology is, is clear and not sort of producing false positives. Okay. Um, let's see. We already covered the frequency. Um, how do you account for what might be natural? Yeah, again, the, the WQI itself um, is not really the tool we would use for that. It would be more um, the actual on the ground data collection that if we're out there and we see that we're having those exceedances um, due to natural conditions, then we circle back through um, the assessment and exclude those natural exceedances from the, the overall 305B assessment. Okay. And I've got one more for Matt. Um, uh, how do you tease out in the monitoring data if improvements are due to changes in hydrology or actually reflect BMP implementation is working? 
Yeah, great question. So two parts to that is the first one, USGS actually developed a new method a few years back called um, WRTDS. I can't remember what it all stands for, but it's a rated, it's a weighted regression based sampling method. And what we, we, uh, we need their data to tell us what's happening in the watershed. And so they run this WRTDS method on that website that I showed. And the result of that WRTDS method is the, uh, the long-term or short-term trends. Um, so we calibrate the model to that information. And in doing so, we also ask the states, the second part of the question is, we also ask the states to provide their entire history of BMPs as best they can, um, which sounds pretty daunting, but actually when you ask the states to do it, they realize that there's a, there's a pretty uh, steady linear ramp up from the mid 1990s on urban and from the 2000s forward on um, USDA and RCS practices for ag. So you can kind of see the trends in the model and the model starts to uh, calibrate back to that water quality, understanding that there are some BMPs in there. It's not perfect. You can't tease it all out of the monitoring data or the model, but using the two of them combined, hopefully we get closer to what is the anthropogen anthropogenic uh, effect, not just from land use change, but also BMPs on the watershed. Okay, great. Um, that's all the questions I think have come in. Um, so uh, that'll do it for today's uh, webinar. Thanks everyone for joining and thanks uh, Jason and Matt for great presentations. Um, so reminder, these will be presentations and recording will be on our website um, early next week. I will send a link to all attendees when that happens. Please take the exit survey of any follow-up questions you may have, as well as any ideas that you may want to see in a future webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jasper. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.